Hello, everyone. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Amin, uh, and like, I'd like to tell you a story about what we were, what we were doing uh, about a year ago in Azerbaijan. And the reason I want to tell a story is because when we choose a technology, there is all sorts of kind of choices that we need to make, all sorts of frameworks, all sorts of uh, toolboxes, all sorts of languages. And if you look at their websites, all of them got a great tutorials, they've got documentation, and list of big companies using those same tools to build their product. But what, what's missing quite often is something in the middle. Uh, what's missing is story, not from the Googles, Facebooks, and Apples of the world, who can build anything in any language through uh, unlimited resources. A story from a company that is constrained by budget, by time, by the, uh, by, by the market. A story that you can relate to, uh, that is very similar to where you're coming from. Uh, a story from someone who can convince you, or if that's worked for them, maybe this is something that would work for us. And this is the kind of story I'd like to talk about. And hopefully, I will be able to show what worked for us. And maybe this will help you drive your technology decisions. So to set the scene, I will just quickly go through who I am and what were the challenges that we have faced and how we solved them. So I live in Azerbaijan, and it's a small post-Soviet country. Uh, it's about six times smaller than Spain. And like most post-Soviet countries, we went from going from almost no technology in late 90s to a lot of technology in the last five to 10 years. You've got all sorts of high-speed internet, ubiquitous 3G and now 4G, smartphone revolution, everything that uh, we all know and love. And on top of that, rapid growth of rapid adoption of technology, Mobile services and web services uh, have also seen a great adoption. So everyone is using, using Facebook, using Instagram, using YouTube, um, Google Plus. Well, maybe not this one. And this adoption of global services led to rise of the local services. And we have found ourselves at the forefront of that growth. And in our country, we run <coughs> a classified service and depending on where you come from, you probably have heard of Avito or Elix or Craigslist. And uh, there are others, other players in this market. But basically, this is a way for people to buy and sell stuff online. And, if, uh, and what we have found, found is that on top of that technology growth, we have been seeing this massive growth. We went in 18 months, it's almost uh, grew from 300,000 monthly users to a million and a half. And uh, we had to manage all this growth, but we were still very limited, had very limited resources, a small team, and we really had to pick our battles. Uh, at the same time, uh, what we have seen is already, because of what happens when you rapidly adapt the technology, you tend to jump over a few generations. So what happened is mobile revolution probably started even earlier in Azerbaijan than globally, I think from 2014. Uh, we have seen in our, all of our projects almost 70% of mobile, uh, almost 70% almost of the users coming from mobile devices, not counting tablets, iPads. And this was the case for this project, and 70% were using the mobile website. And for a long time, we've thought, that's all right, we've got a desktop website, we've got a mobile website, uh, we focus a lot on mobile experience, making sure it works fast and on every device. But also, we realized at some point, and I think that point for us was when we've been reaching a million users, is that people start to expect you to have a mobile app to, uh, at, at some stage. It's almost demand you to have an app, because they open up the app store, they look up for your applications, they don't find you. And this also leaves a space for competition to come in and capture your market uh, by being there where you are not. So we understood that we have to do something about it, but at the same time, uh, we still we really had to make it very efficiently. And we had a few criteria that uh, we, had, we had to adapt if we were able to pull it off. And obviously, we are doing web development. We love to deploy many times a day. We want to be able to launch and iterate quickly. 
But we don't have anyone on the team who has got previous mobile experience, not at all. No one knows Objective-C, no one knows Java, no one knows the specifics of building an apps for iOS and Android. And we really wanted to avoid that. We don't want to build separate teams, one team for iOS, one team for Android, one team for the web. Then you have to synchronize all of the deployments and changes and everything, support multiple products. But we also wanted to have the access to all of the native features and have, if we were able to do it, uh, fast and uh, fluid experience on all platforms. So uh, we started looking at our options. And if you look at the mobile at landscape between going, doing a website and building a full-blown native app, there are all sorts of different possibilities in between uh, hybrid apps. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm calling anything that is not a native app a hybrid. And uh, it's impossible to obviously look at all of those options. So we looked at three main types of things. One is very first, very simple. You just wrap a website, call it a day, and you have something uh, on the screens, on the phone screens of the customers. They can use it. And if the website is good, then probably the application is also good enough. But what we have found out is expectations are different when you use a mobile, when you use a, a mobile app. And if you provide the same level of experience on a web, mobile website and your mobile app, it will have per, the perceived, uh, perceived ex, uh, experience will be worse. And, uh, but at the same time, it shouldn't be underestimated, because it's easy for us geeks to add a bookmark and access a website. But for many people, putting this icon on their, on their phone screen may be the easiest way to access your service. And even if it's a less uh, lesser experience than your mobile website, you may want to do that while developing your native app. Looking back, I think we should have done that. Second option was is to go semi-native, if you like. And this is the best option when you have a lot of different screens. And it was particularly suitable for us because we use Ruby on Rails on the back, on the back end. And folks from Basecamp have created this product called Turbolinks, where you build a native shell in a native language, but everything else is loaded as a web view, and it works quite, quite well. Uh, still, it required us to, to go for this option. We needed to have some experience, even if relatively small, with Objective-C and Java. It's still slower than native apps, uh, and it still requires you, in many cases, to go to the app stores to update your app. So with that, we arrived at the third option, uh, which is using uh, a number of toolkits that will allow you to create applications that act and feel like native, but are not, not without using, actually using the native language. And uh, there are a bunch of tools just within these options, but we, only, we started uh, directly with React Native. And I'll tell you why right now. So we have, in the past, used already React on the web. It, we, read about it, we found that it got both good support for both iOS and Android. It's got a mature ecosystem. It's very easy to start. So we decided to just give it a try, just see uh, how it works and what it can do to, for us. And it turns out that starting is really, really easy. Assuming you've got the dependencies installed, assuming you've got, you have your system in place, so you just run those four commands. And in five minutes, uh, you have something running on your device, or an emulator in this case. And while it kind of, you can look at what's the big deal with that, it is kind of a big deal. Because if you think about it, by this time, you have never touched any mobile app development. You don't know anything. You don't know where to start. You don't know what to do. You don't know the platforms. Yet, you already have something running on your device, something that you can tweak, and something that you can easily update in the language you already know. Uh, this is a very important point. It felt like so satisfying to have something up and running. It almost reminded the very early days of when I first uh, stumbled upon HTML and VB script, and you put a loop, and you generate a bunch of tags, and you have something. You have a website. And it's like, wow, I have something up and running. It was the same feeling. Like You, you already have something, and you can work with it. And if you look under the hood, uh, this is this is what it generates. It's got a bunch of configs and dependencies, but the essence is in this file. And as you can see, it's got a bunch of imports, and then there are two main blocks. One is uh, using a, something resembling style sheets to define your app, uh, the visuals of your app. And the second block is a component. And if you notice what it has, it, it renders 
a block of, uh, which contains view, and within this view, there is a text component. And this is really important. And now, if you know a bit of JavaScript, you probably can read it. You probably can understand what it does. So you create a container which renders a text. But the important part is, despite this being a JavaScript, despite this being not a native language, this, uh, those are real native components. So what you do with JavaScript, you define how you, want to, how you want components to look. You define how you want them to behave. Basically, you orchestrate the whole environment. But you do that in, your language, in the language that, you're, that you already know. And this, this, this was great. This was great for us. And even if I stop here, for, for people who love JavaScript, this is uh, kind of a short introduction that you can, what, what you can do with React Native. But for us, it wasn't enough. Uh, because I'm not sure how many people in this room love and breath JavaScript, but for us, coming from the Ruby background on the server, every time we needed to touch front-end code on our websites, going to JavaScript, it was kind of a mess. All of those quicks and rats and lack of standard library and uh, a lot of issues. And when we faced this problem first in web world, uh, we st uh, started looking for alternatives of what we can do, what we can use instead of JavaScript. And we ended up, assess after assessing all of the alternatives, choosing ClojureScript. I won't go too much in detail of why specifically ClojureScript, but it's a great language. Uh, it's got all of the things that we cared about. And uh, it allowed us to work. It works great with React specifically. Its paradigms are fit very nicely. So we adapted it for all of our web development where we use React. And uh, I highly recommend this talk, ClojureScript for Skeptics, which is describes, it goes in depth as to why you may want to choose instead of JavaScript, why it may not be as crazy uh, as it may seem uh, when you first at least look at the ClojureScript code for the first time. So uh, we chose ClojureScript. And for when you, just to show you an example of how it works, this is an example from the web development. This is um, like reagent wrapper for React component uh, for the web. And even if you, you probably can make out what it is about, it renders a div, which, and it, I show you how it shows, how it renders uh, in the lower part of the screen. It shows, renders a div which, with a couple of paragraphs and there is a formatting. But the important part here is we don't have any custom objects, we don't have any classes. Uh, it's basically a function that's called simple component that returns an array or vector, as we call it in Closure World. And this is the common theme in Closure World. It's a function that manipulates data structures. So instead of having all sorts of different objects, you try to uh, work with uh, data structures, and then you can apply all of the power of the language to work with it. And uh, let's see a more involved example. Uh, this one uses, um, it's got global state. And again, if you ever worked with React, you know that Basically, your UI is a function of a state. And in this case, the state is number of clicks. It's called click count. And uh, we initialize it to 0. But the important part is, in the counting component, in the bottom, there is an on-click event. And when you click the button, it calls a swap function, which increments the click counter. And everything else is done transparently. You don't need to do anything else. You update the global state. And any component that, ref uh, that refers that um, atom, we call it atom, the global state, will be automatically re-rendered. So you don't need to worry about flows. You don't need to worry about anything else. You just update the state, and your UI re-renders automatically. And it turns out that this simple concept is all you need to know to actually go ahead and develop mobile app using ClojureScript and React Native. I'll show it in a minute. But before I do, this may look unfamiliar. I mean, what is it? Parents in the beginning, a bunch of parents at the end, and different types of parents. But I just wanted to make a note that just because it's unfamiliar doesn't mean that it's complex. Actually, uh, quite often people confuse concepts of simple and easiness. For instance, for me, Spanish is hard. I don't know Spanish. For many people in this room, you probably were able to speak it fluently since, you went, since when you were a kid. So it doesn't mean Spanish 
simple or complicated by itself. For you, it's easy. For me, it's hard. But if you want to objectively assess its complexity, you have to look at the grammar rules, inflections, all sorts of things to see which language is simpler, which one is more complex. So the closure script, while it's unfamiliar, it's actually a much simpler language, very clear and concise language, much simpler than JavaScript, by the way. So once you go beyond that point of unfamiliarity, you start to look at it differently. And I highly recommend this talk, even if you don't develop mobile apps, even if you don't do any closure script or even JavaScript, this talk that makes it clear what is simple and what is easy is I highly recommend it. It will make you a better developer. So let's see how we, get, how we do that in closure script. Almost the same four commands. Uh, like in uh, React Native world. And again, after five minutes, of, you already have something up and running, a little bit more advanced than the React Native version. And again, for me, this was a moment that was sort of a liberating experience when I understood that we can actually build it. I can open this closure script code, I can change a bunch of things, and immediately I can see it on my device. I connect my iOS device, I connect my Android device, and I can see that it's working. It gave me a confidence coming from the web development background that we will be able to actually pull it off without building a huge team. We can do something that anyone on the team will understand. So let's just to see how closure script compares to JavaScript, let's I dumped it down to the standard React Native version. And this is what you see. And again, just like in JavaScript version, you've got a bunch of imports. And then you have two blocks. One defines styles, and one defines uh, component. And if you notice, in the JavaScript version, you had a style sheet class. In here, we just have a hash or map uh, that contains styles. The components, the view itself, also is a function that returns an array, a vector. The only difference with the web version is that instead of diffs and paragraphs, you work with views and text and dozens of other native controls. Uh, but you never have to think about anything else. You just manipulate those data structures with your favorite programming language. And let's see how it compares. So this is the same piece of code from JavaScript version, and below is the closure script version. And if you notice, in the JavaScript world, you have class listings that extends component, which has got render function, which returns JSX, which is then transformed to uh, native code. And as I said, in closure script version, it's just a function which returns a vector, which is, that's, that's the kind of simplicity that we talk about, that it may not be familiar, but it's very simple, just a function and data structure. So with that, uh, we built a prototype. We, deci we decided it's good enough uh, to start experimenting. We built a prototype in a couple of weeks, and we've thought, yes, we can do it. So we hired a full-time engineer to work just on this project on both iOS and, Androids, and Android. And uh, in three months of work, we, including mock-ups, including back-end API design, including uh, markup of the app itself, we have been able to developed and launched our app to not a, bet, not a better version, but actually a production version of our app. It was about 5,000 lines of code, including all of the styles. And it had, had not, no native code at all, except some configuration, which I can't really uh, say that it's a code. And this is what we were able to, I hope it plays, to develop. Yep. So it's got a bunch of features like endless scroll of listings, search and filter per category fields, detailed view, photo galleries with zoom, swipe to back, both on iOS and Android, native share functionality, bookmarks, ability to post your listings. Uh, it works in two languages, so it's got internationalization built in. I mean, it's not a huge app, but it's not very basic. And as you can hopefully see, it's very fast and fluid, and the experience is the same on both iOS and Android. So if there is just one takeaway from uh, this talk is that you can actually, this is type of thing you can build uh, with React Native, with or without ClojureScript, hopefully with ClojureScript, and it will work really well. It certainly worked very well for us. And while I cannot obviously show the whole uh, number of issues we had to face when developing, making it fast and fluid, I would like to focus on a couple of specific examples that demonstrate the amount of effort you need to put in to make it work well. Because when you think about it, there was nothing stopping us from launching it in a month. 
We actually did develop first version in less than months. What, it, what did take time is ironing out all of issues. And this is a specific example. I see it very often. It's not a rocket science, but it's so much, so many uh, developers for some reason don't do that that I decided to bring it up as an example. Probably it's because when you work locally, you have a local database or you have a fast connection to your production version. You have a listings of product. When you click on it, you fire a request and you load the full product description. And again, as I say, where you work locally, it's very fast, it's instantaneous, and you don't uh, think about it. But when you are putting it uh, to end users, say maybe on a larger 3G connection, they may have a uh, slower device, that which requires kind of every request counts, and it's much less fluid experience. But if you think about it, when we show the listing, listing of all the products, we already have title, we already have a first picture, we already have a price, we already have some other data like date and location. And because it's a React world, it's very easy instead of just firing a request to server, waiting it for it to come back, you can render what you have. You can render that picture, you can render a title, and then fire a request and get everything else so that it loads. And as it loads, you just set the state, just like in a counter example, you just update the state as it arrives from the server and it gets progressively rendered. So this will be a much better experience, it will be an improvement, but we can do even better. Because when you think about it a little bit more, the amount of data that's shown on this screen is incrementally very small. It's just a short description, a couple of attributes, and maybe a couple of additional data like phone number and anything. So it's just a few hundred bytes per listing. So instead of firing a request every time you open it, open the product, you can load all of this data while loading the list of products. Yes, you increase the payload. Obviously, it's a little bit bigger. But after you zip it, after you, um, once you zip it, basically, you just have an incremental maybe of a few kilobytes of data. And compare it to one image, less than one image size, it's so much better experience. We still fire, that's what we do. We still fire a request for additional data that is below default, some like related products other data by this customer, something like that. But you never notice that. As far as you are concerned, you clicked and it's immediate. You can't get faster than that. So the, you're only bounded by animation time, I think. Another example is also uh, it's a sim in a similar uh, way, uh, the same type of effect. Basically, you open the category. When you click on it, you open a subcategory. And again, quite often what I see is on every level that you go, you get a small delay while you get data from the server. But if you take the whole tree, the whole tree of categories with all of its properties, with all of its data, it's just a few kilobytes of data. Nothing stops you in the very first time when you launch this, when you launch the app to download the whole tree and update it in the background. Update in background when customer does not notice. It's a data that doesn't up update frequently. You don't need to update it every minute. You can update it once a day, once an hour, whatever fits your schedule. But as far as customer is concerned, it's immediate. You don't ever need to go anywhere, and it's always up to date at the same time. So very important details, and we had a lot of details like that, and uh, that, that's, that's what takes most of the time. So be wary of just creating and launching it uh, without working out all of those uh, small nuances. That makes a difference between a good and great app, in my opinion, at least. OK, so we have created an app, and it needs to get the data from the server. It needs to interact with the server. And you can say, OK, we've got a JSON for that. And you would be right. You can use JSON. JSON is good. JSON works. Everyone knows this. But it's not great. And if you ever had to pass a date or a float or a set to work with that in JSON, you will know what I'm talking about. You have to go through the hoops to just to kind of wrap it and unwrap it uh, on the sending and receiving side. And transit format. It's developed by the same company that develops Clojure. It works just like Clojure works on JVM and Clojure Script works on top of JavaScript. Transit works on top of JSON and Message Pack if you work with binary formats. It supports any, of the, any data type. It can have arbitrary keys, not just strings. It's completely language agnostic. There are a bunch of official implementations, and there are unofficial implementations in every, almost every language. So you can use transit format to say, connect your Angular app to your Django backend. I mean, it's not related to ClojureScript at all. 
And because it's built on top of existing platform, it's got a very high efficient parser. And it also has built-in compression and caching for even more faster transmission times and, and, and parsing time. So I highly recommend using transit format. And again, just like with uh, previous examples, I would like to give a specific example of when it helps. On the back end, we use Ruby. And if you use Ruby, you will know that idiomatic Ruby uses symbols as a keys for hash. So instead of using string, you would use a symbol. And the same happens to, uh, to be the case in closure world. Uh, and it's, um, it's called keyboard. And if we were using JSON to send our hash from backend to frontend, we would we have a few cho two choices. Either we have to downgrade to lowest common denominator and use string as a key, or we have to find some sort of way to parse and uh, to encode and decode the uh, symbol from symbol to keyword ours by ourselves. We don't need to worry about that in transit format. Any of the standard data types are supported from. Uh, for each language. If there is a match between your two languages, they will be transparently linked. Basically, the way I like to think about it is it's got all of the benefits of JSON without all of its drawbacks. So I highly recommend it to you to use wherever you would, you would use otherwise JSON, especially if you struggle with those problems with dates, floats, or strings as keys. Um, so we built an app. We created a backend, so backend um, API. And now the time comes, and we want to update it. Everyone does. And if you think about the first version of an app that I suggested is like Website Wrapper, whenever we update it, whenever you update your website, it's immediately up to date on, on the customer's device. Not so much with a native app. Obviously, you have to go through the app stores. You have to wait for a few days until it, until it gets reviewed, at least in the Apple world. You lose all of the reviews, by the way. Uh, because by default, Apple shows only the latest revision. And basically, it just doesn't have enough of velocity and feedback loops that we are all used to in the web world. But since here we also use JavaScript, we use standard assets like images and style sheets, well, JavaScript mostly, uh, there is nothing stopping us from doing the same as if it was a website and update it over the air. Now, a little bit more steps are involved. You have to use some third-party servers to send a notification. And we use Code Push. That's a service by Microsoft, by the way. It's free for now. Uh, it probably will be paid eventually. What it allows you to do is, obviously, you register and integrate into your app. But then, whenever you are ready to update, you push your, your updated version to the Code Push servers, and all of your apps get a notification, you can schedule it whenever you want. You may want to check it every minute, on the launch, whenever you want. And you can download this new JavaScript bundle and apply it on the customer's device without them ever updating, doing anything manually. And you can do it uh, as involved as you want to. You may want to show a notice, do you want to upgrade? You may want to update it in the background. When we started, we did it in a really stupid way. We just downloaded it immediately and applied it immediately. So you would be in the middle of your flow, and then, wow, application will reload. Now we're doing it a little bit more uh, clever. We download it as soon as it's available. Then we went for a period of inactivity, like 10 or 15 minutes. And when you come back, you already see a new version. So this worked very well for us. Because most features don't require you to upgrade, like ask for new permissions, which requires updating binary. You don't need to upgrade React Native every month. You don't need to uh, include any custom libraries every month. So most features are just fix here and there, a little bit feature here, some text updates, a new field, update to API, and things like that. So what you can do, you can apply those changes immediately, and then accumulate them. And every once in a while, you do a proper release, which has got all of those features included for people who download it for the first time. But otherwise, everyone else who is actively using your app, we already have all of those uh, features. So it's very simple. You just have a bunch of commands you list, you, that allow you to list all of your deployments. You release your application. And then you can roll back if something goes wrong. And then you, you can also watch the adoption, how many people are on which version of your app. Uh, basically, you get a full control of what you want to send uh, to customers. 
And let's see the results that we were able to get. So in, we launched about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago. We were supporting iOS 8 and Android 4.1 and above. We, by now, we have about 200,000 installs. And we've got about 20% of the daily sessions from the mobile app. Apparently, mobile apps users are more happy because they install the app and they're more active. So you get a higher percentage of the sessions. And our average rating, average rating is 4.7 from 3,000 reviews. And while obviously part of it is because of the service that we provide, we like to think that some of it is because the application itself works quite well. Speaking of crash-free sessions, when we started, it was about 80%. Uh, so the first better version. So we had to debug and find uh, reasons for why, why it was caused. It's mostly about out-of-memory errors if you don't take if you don't control how much data you try to process at one particular moment, and a number of bugs in React Native itself. But we were able, within a month, to, le to bring it up, I think, to 99% when we launched, and now 99.8, which is, I think, five times more reliable than 99. So we still strive to get three nines. Uh, hopefully, uh, actually, on iOS, we were able already to get three nines. On Android, it's still 99.8. And so yeah, average rating, as I said, is 4.7. And there was one review that I wanted to share with you today. It was like, <laughs> I didn't like the app, but I'll give you five stars for the effort. <laughs> Not every day do you get a custo customers who are conscious of the effort uh, that you, pulled, that you put uh, into developing an app. Other reviews, I promise, are really happy about the app. So thank you, Anonymous reviewer, and thank you for listening to me today. Thank you. I mean, that was a really awesome and inspiring story. Thank you. Um, I think you should have that comment like at, as the top review in your app. <laughs> um, so we, we got a bunch of questions from the audience. Um, how much code is shared between the iOS and Android apps? Um, I think it's more than 99%. I can't give you the more precise figure, but basically almost everything that we do uh, is platform agnostic. The only things that when we had to um, access, do different functions is, for instance, when you want to get a device ID, unique device ID, to send to the server to the API, the methods to call it are different on iOS and Android. So you create two different functions, and then you have a wrapper function that, depending on the device, calls one of those. But those are far and few in between. Mostly, it's just like pure closure script without any ifs uh, and conditions for the platform. So it's more than an absent. Nice. How do you debug crashes that could potentially happen on app submit to the Apple Store? Um, that's a very good one. Um, the, it, it's difficult. It is difficult. Unfortunately, there is no easy answer. Basically, we use Crashlytics service to monitor the errors, and when we see when someone, some, an app crashes, we get a report with a stack trace. Unfortunately, this stack trace is a little bit hard to read. That's because you've got a React Native stack, and on top of it, you've got a closure script, compiled closure script stack, uh, stack. So it's a bit hard, but usually you can make out what is happening by the error, say it's out of memory error, or some library crashed, or something. So we were using that to debug. Uh, it wasn't the easiest part of the experience, but we were able, as I said, to get to 99.8. Very impressive. We have a question about building local tech communities. Is there a big ClojureScript community in Azerbaijan? How do you find and develop ClojureScript talent? Yeah, the short answer is no, there is no big community. I think there is almost no community at all, actually. <laughs> uh, the, we, we work remotely, all of our teams work remotely, so we don't constrain ourselves to local market. And uh, so that's how we find developers, basically looking at, at it globally. Unfortunately, I'm yet to see any activity in ClojureScript community in Azerbaijan. Mm. Using frameworks like React Native, animations are often a problem. Did you encounter any, and how did you tackle them? It's very important. Uh, it's a very good question, because animation is quite often is a source of lags uh, in your UI because you've got two threads, basically the main thread, the UI thread, and the JavaScript thread that controls the UI. So if you do a lot of work during animation, because animation is controlled by JavaScript thread, it may become laggy. So you really have to take care of 
not to do, not to do a lot of work while you animate. So there are built-in features, that you, built-in components and effects that you can use, but you really have to be careful. Uh, and we had that problem in the first version of our app. It was that uh, you click, it moves, but sometimes, because something's happening in the background, it starts lagging. So we st drilled down into all of those issues and made sure we don't do any extra work while the animation is uh, going, working, doing its Nice. Work. Um, if you were to build Tap as over again, knowing what now what you what you know, would you develop the backend in Clojure instead of Ruby? The backend app, uh, I guess, if it's instead of Ruby, then yes. Well, actually, we do plan to move to Clojure on the backend. Mm. Uh, we started building this app uh, a few years ago, so and we all of our other apps are also in Ruby. And the good part of, about it is because we use transit format. Once we upgrade or change, I shouldn't use the word upgrade, change from Ruby to Clojure, we don't have to change the interface. Because if it was, if we, if we were using JSON and we would now change from Ruby to Clojure, it would be like having Clojure and Clojure script working with JSON format instead of speaking in a more rich format. So we completely avoid that problem. So eventually, once we change, all of our clients will be able to work with exactly the same API because it will be speaking the same. Uh, language. It's the same format, transit format. Nice. For the live updates, what's the status of Apple's guidelines about pushing code over the network? Is the code push method allowed, or is it still a gray area? It was a gray area for a long time. As the latest I have read was quite a while ago, because Apple changed their terms and services, and they allowed this type of update. Basically, uh, I don't remember the details, but I remember very well that these kind of applications are fine. They are not a gray area anymore. There are some cases where you cannot do update over the air, but they are not related to this kind of uh, cross-compilation and downloading of the JavaScript over the web. Awesome. One last question before we break. Um, what challenges did you face when implementing platform-specific design? For example, Android's material design versus Apple's human interface design. Well, we completely avoided that problem because we didn't use, follow any of the guidelines. Uh, you may have, <laughs> because uh, we, what we tried to do, we tried to replicate our mobile experience. Uh, so the design looks the same, both on mobile website and on mobile app, so which means we didn't try to follow the guidelines of how to do selects, how to do forms, so we don't have that problem. But if you use native components uh, for, say, inputs, uh, uh, they will behave, depending on the platform, they will behave di a little bit differently following the guidelines of the local platform. Obviously, you, you then have to consider the design issues and maybe add additional conditionals uh, to make them work exactly the same, but we didn't have this problem, so I can't really be the best person to answer that. Nice. I, I got one last comment. Someone said, I didn't really like your talk, but I give you five stars for the effort. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Thank you so much, I mean, Thank that was you. fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you.